Hey friends, welcome back to another episode of Storytime with Chantastic. Today, I am joined by Jen Chan. Super excited to have her on the show to talk about getting into design systems. Uh, it, we had a really great chat before this talking about kind of how there's no clear path to getting into design systems work. And so I just wanted to uh, have her on the show and we could talk about like what that has looked like for her, how she's leading people into the field. And uh, yeah, so Jen, if you don't mind, uh, could you take a second and just introduce yourself to uh, everyone watching this? Hey, uh, thanks a lot for having me. Uh, it's just uh, really great to be talking about this with you and also a bit about me, I've been working in dev for about five years. I started off in your kind of run-of-the-mill emails and support roles and then got into front end and it had some pepperings of UX. I used to teach um, new media art, digital literacy classes, and I made the switch because I just enjoy learning a lot more and also just implementing well. But I never really quite stopped just constantly like bugging people about like the implementation of design and I'm always just like that person that's like wedged my way and attached myself to like uh, product managers and designers um, just to kind of see how to best implement their vision and yeah so here I am. Nice nice now one thing that I think is important context uh, is that you've been organizing Toronto JS which is if I remember correctly like one of the biggest uh, tech meetups on meetup.com. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, uh, Toronto JS? Yeah, it's actually really exploded since the pandemic. I think we have over 10,000 members and could be arguably like the biggest coding community. That's meetup wild. For JavaScript. Yeah, um, it was started in 2010, um, founded by Taz Singh, who has gone to uh, start another meetup alternative called Guild. It's just for organizing communities. But yeah, um, through Taz, Paul Doman, who started a agency called OK Focus, uh, Miho, or Matthew Miho, but he prefers to be called Miho, uh, who has been running it um, since 2014-ish. And yeah, he invited me on. Um, yeah, Dan Tolliver was the one who was running the JS workshop part. This is all very discombobulated, but it's an amalgamation of like four events with yeah. a group of four friends who were running together. And um, yeah, he invited me on first as a mod and um, started kind of like setting up this like vigilante two tier moderation group uh, because during COVID there were a lot of Upwork scams and fake job postings and just wanted to make sure the community, you know, wasn't falling prey to, you know, giving away sense of information or applying for jobs that kind of didn't really actually exist. And it all kind of, you know, bloomed, I think, from um, beginning to engage with this community since I was around two or three years in, and I had been silently observing and just like <laughs> seeing what people would talk about. And um, I would get stuck at work, you know, while working at um, some more bootstrapped startups. And, you know, all the senior devs would just be really, you know, just they would be busy and tied up in meetings. And so just by asking the help channel, uh, same thing I do on the storybook discord, like, you know, asking the support channel, I was getting eight times the feedback and help. And I, so I got to know the people that were regulars there. And um, yeah, I was invited like to organize like over a year ago. And so I just really wanted to show off, you know, the talent. Um, they're, they're all very humble. It just turned out the people who were responding and helping me with like all my questions were like, I don't know, directors, and <laughs> engineering teams, and like senior devs. And it's just been like super fantastic being able to learn from them and also, you know, build out like um, the, I guess, community for people that are new and, um, you know, looking to get into dev as well as like kind of trying to create those like conversation spaces for people who have more experience. And a lot of times people say like senior devs are actually the ones that, you know, don't have support as much because they might be the most senior in the company. And so um, also making sure that, you know, maybe when you encounter each other in a digital space, you don't immediately jump to like, hmm, what company do you work for? And like, you know, <laughs> not, not the sense of like, you know, what are your stripes type thing. Um, really trying to create an environment that's like pro learning, um, also like maybe like not this kind of 
elitist kind of feeling where, oh, wait, you don't know this. And yeah, uh, it's been very rewarding. Yeah. I love that. I, I love the idea of um, communities. You raise a really interesting point, right? Which is this, this, this idea that communities are filled with a lot of people who are kind of at different stages in their life, but you also have uh, people who are like really senior who t- are in that community to be able to like answer questions that they aren't able to answer, right? They're looking for answers on things that uh, people, like, you know, maybe framework experience or tooling experience that like other people have um, that they don't have and uh, to be able to like get that information from the community. And so jumping into communities is a really interesting way to do networking and fast track your career because there's a lot of people at different companies, at different places in their career that can kind of lead you, but then also you can uh, help them with some piece of knowledge that you have that they might not have. Uh, it, it sounds like you were able to use that to really kind of uh, quickly, like, I guess, rise up in the ranks of Toronto JS to be organizing and leading events. And I'm curious, like how I came from a similar type of experience where I kind of got involved in a, a meetup event and then over the next six months turned into like running the event almost like wholesale. And I'm curious, like how... How important was that to the early part of your career development? I would say that like this started maybe more like part way after I had three or four years experience. So I think it was being in this kind of uh, isolated space where I wasn't exchanging notes or sharing experiences with other people uh, with more experience in dev or, you know, even just starting out that I think I missed the kind you know i was treating every job i had like this formative you know tough love journey and you know <laughs> being able to talk and share with peers and get feedback from them um has helped me so much and so like finding out and getting to know people's practice mm-hmm. um just you know on a very like hey i'm a dev and you're a dev or i design and i do this too kind of thing has really been super enriching because i can really understand you know how they approach learning and, yeah. you know, wanting and hoping that like, oh yeah, you just like really actually spent 15 minutes typing out step-by-step step how something works to me. Like, you know, you're totally like passionate about this. So please give a talk. Um, so just like hoping that, you know, it's not just this area where like people just stay, you know, on the thread, but hoping yeah. that they're, you know, interested to share it with other people. And a lot of times, I mean, despite, me right now, just having five years, um, having that people on there with 10 years, sometimes they're still shy, you know, to give a talk or that's not their favorite thing. Maybe they want to give a workshop or a lightning demo. And um, so, yeah, also kind of encouraging them and moving them forward because of like how they've helped me or like, um, you know, realizing that they have a ton of knowledge in just this like specific area. Um, and yeah, Toronto JS is not just for JavaScript. We actually just <laughs> We have a Python channel as well, where people can hear that I'm like kind of muddling through learning it. Um, and yeah, people talk about Rust and Go um, DevOps. And so, yeah, really like finding areas where like people can share their experience with everyone else. Yeah. Yeah. I love that too, because like a lot of times you will take those communities with you between jobs, right? So the the friends and relationships that you make inside of a community, uh, they're really not like beholden to the boundaries of of your job. Like as soon as you leave a job, like you're out of that Slack channel, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But like a community kind of persists between jobs and the, um, you know, I mean, unless you unless you become a real jerk at some point and get booted, <laughs> like you really kind of can yeah. take those relationships with you for a really long time in your career, which is really exciting. Yeah, that's definitely something that's been ultra important to me in terms of like almost thinking about like a garden, right? Where people talk about gardening docs, but, um, you know, there's the aspect of like maintaining your relationships, you know, seeing your friends when it's their birthday or like yeah. you know, doing things you enjoy with together. And I feel the community is the same, right? Like there's all these people contributing with their voices and their ideas on uh, helping each other. But also I think like how I became involved and maybe part of me, it has this like aspect of like, Oh, let's do this thing. Or like, wouldn't it be interesting if we did this thing? We did that for um, JS code club or JavaScript, uh, 
JS Code Club once where uh, we had like three virtual breakout tables with like an ask me anything for senior devs or um, oh, cool. engineering managers and people were rotating tables and it was all very fun and like senior folks felt they got out, like, you know, a lot out of it from being asked like this uh, questions from people with less experience or even other seniors and yeah. people who were like junior, of course, like flocked there because they, you know, didn't have that many opportunities to really like ask senior folks like honest questions outside of a work environment yeah so yeah I, I think that there is an aspect of like being able to connect with people outside of the constructs or rules of work <laughs> that really appealed to me as part of like community stuff and i even going to in real life events i would like avoid the ones that had a lot of vendors there um might be a common thing for women in dev or when you first enter dev, sometimes they might like ask you to apply for jobs that might not entirely be related to tech or like in the case, like the four hours ask event model. Um, and so I, I like it much more when the events or the things are really like about the things I'm yeah. interested in, you know, like <laughs> how to, I don't know, migrate a framework, you know, to a newer version or like how to build like a browser extension. Um, and so, yeah, I think like, having a community that is motivated to share um, and also like be open, not like maybe like, I don't know. I, I hate like, you know, calling um, a, a fierce like passion for or rigor or whatever to, it's not like elitist if you're like willing to, you know, spend the time to adjust your language to different audiences. Yeah. And yeah, so I, I've been really like happy to have like Miho's support for that as well as uh, Taz. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because there's a lot of different, you know, you, you touch on a lot of different motivations that there are in the tech space, right? And, you know, you come in and you are so excited to just get in the space. And a lot of times, like, you can find a level of misdirection, right? And you, you mentioned sometimes, you know, people might have the best intentions, but sometimes, you know, vendors or companies might take that enthusiasm and then kind of use it to their own advantage. And so having a space that's very virtuous where you are talking about the things that interest you, talking about the actual work um, in a place where people don't necessarily have anything to gain from it, except just sharing and uh, kind of like bringing people along who are, you know, not quite as far along as they are. Um, I love that. Like, I, I think that that we like we need more of those spaces to help people answer the questions that they have about how to get into a space, what that space looks like five, 10 years down the road. Um, it's, you know, being able to get that lens into the future and uh, and kind of avoid some of the mistakes that you know maybe you or I had to make along the way as we're figuring out this uh, this path into the things that we like, uh, which kind of leads me into like the the main question that we have, which is about design systems and how you break into design systems because I think we have a lot of experience now trying to figure out what a path looks like into this field, but right now there isn't really a clear path for someone who's just entering the field, who's like, oh, design systems actually seem like a pretty cool intersection of the things that I'm interested in. Uh, how do I do that? <laughs> and so I'm curious for people who are interested in that path, like how are you directing them uh, right now? Yeah, that's a super low bit in uh, layered <laughs> kind of question because I sometimes um, think that like, oh yeah, it's hard enough to keep a job in dev in that first couple of years um, have described to me like they felt like they were treading water or yeah. they felt like a, a huge enormous slope like being at the bottom of a mountain and there's just constantly ossifying amounts of stuff they don't know yet and i can really strongly relate to that like you know looking at job descriptions that look like wish lists of yeah. you know infinite things that i don't know and then also thinking like oh yeah. Um, does it mean I have to choose one thing or another? Or um, there was also the sense that, oh, yeah, I must meet most of the criteria on a full stack dev or a whatever, like front end engineer job post to be considered a legit, you know, candidate or a legit, you know, candidate in this career path. And I think that 
um, after talking to more peers online, especially hanging out in the Angular Discord, mm -hmm. Reactive Flux, um, Storybook Discord as well, is like finding that a lot of my peers who now work in design systems had their own very unique or kind of like twist and turn paths. A lot <laughs> of them, um, you know, sometimes might have like done some design or some UX and then um, had also done some front end work and kind of ended up there. Uh, like there's like people who did like, computer science degrees, but really found that they were more interested in systematic kind of robust implementation of UIs. And I wholly admire those people so much. <laughs> it's like, oh, I wish I did my education backwards, you know, and was able to really well combine those two interests, um, in terms of computer visualization, animations in browser, that kind of thing. And for me, I learned these concepts backwards, you know, it's like, let me just like bite the bullet and like, you know, reach for a dev job and cut my teeth on it. But I like to like um, tell people when they're going, like in their first stages of going into dev is to really like find, you know, the first job and really hope it's a dev job. Um, I feel like I like might have, you know, um, stymed my own career development by doing like jobs, even if they're front end, like email for a year, <laughs> automating and bug fixing the creation of emails for a year, or like um, support despite having like insane access to like production database. Like it, there wasn't any kind of real dev work yeah. there. So like really, you know, getting your feet wet with like, yeah usual dev responsibilities and then over time figuring out which area that you enjoy more you know is it the integration of different aspects um you know services and back end to the front end or is it like you enjoy actually working with designers and yeah figuring out how to best implement something and uh working that out with your team and so between that i guess and um talking to other people that are in the role that you want to see yourself in. I think uh, that that's my approach. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's really interesting too, because it's, <sighs> there's, I think a lot of times, you know, it's like uh, we, we come into this field and we're looking to get a job, like we're also like coming with a wish list of things, right? But like something that you, you mentioned is really interesting. And, uh, you know, I took that same approach, which is just like, get in there and do like whatever you can, right? Like your first job, maybe your first two, possibly even your first three are really just on this path to getting you to know what you're interested in at all. Um, and that's really hard when you're starting because you kind of want to just like, you know, plop into something and then make sure that that has like the growth potential for you. But it's really like, I think in our field, very unlikely that that would happen. It's really more like you get in and then you use that to get to the next thing. And you kind of like jump in company, like the companies are like Trial the rungs error, on the ladder. Yeah, yeah <laughs> exactly. And also figuring out how to make an impact, right? Like, yeah. I, oh God, I kind of really wish I had read the effective engineers sooner. And there's parts of it that sound a little like, too hustly, you know, like <laughs> trying to make every part of your day, any like repeatable task automatable, that might be taking it a bit too far because you might end up spending more time figuring out how to automate something that maybe isn't very high value to automate. But um, yeah, I think uh, the author talks about like, you know, finding moments of leverage in terms of like being able to um turn a lever at work and figure out, hey, what are the easiest tasks and lowest effort for me to create the largest amount of help or impact or influence across the company? And I think, you know, there, there were probably previous career failure moments where I, um, you know, did more and outside of my role than um, was really helping me grow in my specific role. Um, I Now I'm working at an agency or consultancy and having worked in an agency and also startup context before have like some, uh, I don't know, ideas of like what professional delivery looks like. And, you know, sometimes, and I think um, Tanya Friley has that article being glue where she talks mm. about like, you know, the engineer with a few years who's just started a senior engineer or engineering manager role and 
she never seems to get around to writing enough code because she's, you know, actually working between teams, um, making sure requirements are confirmed. She's drawing out the system diagrams and et cetera. And this was actually, I think, a huge lesson for me to learn in terms of like, okay, if you have a perfectionistic personality and you've also had a range of experiences, like for me, it was like working, you know, between design and dev, doing some UX research as well as like um, initiating triage meetings with like product managers and, you know, doing stakeholder interviews, that kind of thing. Like to really have to contain the desire to do these parts as thoroughly as you might expect them to have mm. been done at previous companies <laughs> it was essential for me to grow as someone who wants to implement and scale design systems. Yeah, I think it, it's good to gain and acquire that experience for sure. But then after that, like really like trying to drill down to the focus of, hey, do I enjoy more so like the, the user research, the product ideation, the road mapping part, or, you know, being a facilitator of design sprints, then by all means, like, you know, go for that one. And then yeah. if you're interested in like UI engineering, whatever, and those aren't the only paths, but like realizing that an interest in that whole area and everything, um, because I just love being on a team and I want the whole team to succeed to not have to take all of that on yourself and like to think about which area, um, what the advancement for that particular role. And in my mind, it's UI engineering or, you know, uh, scaling design systems. And so that, that was a realization I had in the last two years in terms of like road mapping the career in uh, design systems. Yeah. It, it, it's so funny. Cause like, as you're talking about it, you, like I'm, I'm, I'm putting together how many things really are part of design systems like you know we talk about design systems or ui engineering or whatever and it's easy to kind of think of it as just making components but you know as you're describing it it's so much more than that there are all of these like it's the it's the management part of it it's the distribution part of it it's the user research part of it there's like you know the documentation part of it. like all of these things um happen have to happen together and you kind of have to have it a, a broad interest in seeing something succeed more so than just ha having a feature or like a bug get fixed. And this is really interesting because there are, there is such a like broad range of interests that you have to have um, to, I guess, like fit into this field. And I know we've talked about feeling a little bit like misfits kind of early on in our career before it had before we got the name like design systems and kind of before that was like really more of a formed concept. Um, I'm curious, how, how has it felt kind of in those, in those phases before we had language for it, you know, where maybe you were like kind of going in that engineering route. I know obviously you also have, um, you know, your passion is in art. And so how you've kind of like justified the art and engineering as separate parts of your your brain and life um before kind of like finding a place that they could fit together <laughs> it's kind of like a squishy they question <laughs> they're, they're never they were never separate but i think as uh in the first year as i you know embarked on my dev career you know thinking oh yeah front end development and then like immediately very quickly feeling the pressure to become a full stack developer because of job descriptions and listings. And uh, again, feeling that, you know, crushing sense of being at the a really enormous mountain and um, trying to make sure that I could hit every little like bullet point item. Um, I think Sheryl Sandberg, you know, controversial book with the uh, will to lead or lean mm -hmm. in. But she did like mention that women seem to have a tendency to apply for jobs only when they hit like 80 to 100 percent of the criteria mm. and i recall myself having exactly that kind of mental model as well so yeah i i think that really yeah for me realizing that job after job i just constantly gravitated towards how to implement the ui in a you know robust and performant way and also make sure that the rest of the team felt comfortable with it. Yeah. And over time, I'm noticing that a lot of these things are like, it 
writing software is like a human problem. It's um, about how to make sure the rest of your team between design, product, and um, your devs and, you know, your peers are feeling okay with the solution that everyone, you know, is hoping, hopefully has agreed on. Or if they haven't, then like, you know, how are we all going to do this in a way that's going to be productive and maintainable long term? And I think um, instead of the feeling of now, like, perhaps feeling extremely unsure and insecure about my competency based on how much I know is like, how can we throughout the course of, you know, being at work, um, communicate effectively and also, um, you know, find a place where everyone can feel okay with how something's being done. Um, having so many like, you know, thoughts and reflections about that in like the past year, been starting to read Harvard Business Review, funny enough. Uh, but yeah, it, it is a 180 from when I was in academia where people would more often talk about like, you know, inductive, I guess, interdisciplinary thinking and research. Um, this is definitely a lot more squishy. We've all done the kind of like one-on-ones check-ins and then also like uh, sitting together and planning, whiteboarding. I feel like these are things that I actually, you know, the, the having the team together I mean, not extensive long meetings, but like actually sitting down together and yeah. drawing out what people, you know, think and see or understanding why they think something should work a certain way. It's yeah. Like that is a part that I really enjoy. Yeah. I, I, lo- I love that. I love specifically the thing you said, like writing software is a human problem. And I, I always find it fascinating, like how, how hard we try to like over, uh, like make things over academic, like in our own software, instead of leaning into the human problem of like, what, what is our team capable of? What makes us the most productive as a team? Like, how do we make our software as communicative as our, you know, documentation or having a conversation? Um, how do we develop? How do we make the software look like us as a team and how do we make it work for us? Because at the end of the day, it's all like, you know, positive charges and like neutral charges, right? You're like ones and zeros, like, and like the computer doesn't care like how we organize our code. Like there's like, I guess maybe like if you're a performance expert, like, you know, there, there's, you know, that, that line is a little different, but in terms of like, just kind of like writing software as a team, like it is collaborative. It is about people. It is. And the challenge there is like making sure that everyone is incorporated into that process. And I feel like that's some, that, uh, interest or compassion is something that, um, you know, developer productivity and, uh, design systems, um, creators or developers and maintainers, um, they live in that space all the time. And I'm curious, like, do you think that this trend that we're seeing towards developer productivity, towards design systems is something that, uh, like a broader trend that will extend to like how we develop software as companies, like all together across the board? Uh, I can't really say like in terms of 10 year trend or anything. I have noticed that design systems and the, uh, desire to bring teams in house or to build out digital teams in house has like really boomed like post COVID. Um, I think that like people are realizing that there, you know, is a need to create software that is well understood by the end user. So that that space is opening up. I've actually like drawn a very large net over what I find now is like, you know, interesting or an opportunity for people that are interested in design systems to work on. Um, You might have seen me kind of probe this question in the (laughs) talk channel uh, on Discord, but like, you know, um, the do you need a design system kind of audit or conversation? Um, Because maybe people had heard about it being well implemented, you know, by IBM or Shopify. But yeah, the question of capability and how much they're willing to have a dedicated team behind it as well as like, you know, whether they have the time and the resources to do that, right? Um, all seem to be questions that factor in when you're like, first of all approached or like, you know, talking to a business about it. And I think, um, yeah, I, I think I've like become like more like instead of 
oh, I must work on a design system <laughs> because now that I've like done some, it and you know experience the you know fights or struggles like in the change that it might introduce to an organization. Yeah. Sometimes I think like, oh yeah, like you know what's your current state and you know where are you at in terms of how devs and designers collaborate. Um, what processes do you have in place? Yeah. And how can we improve that? And so it might not be like this either design systems or like you are just an engineering focused company with no care for your whatever. Like, yeah. Um, I guess like finding out and trying to meet people where they're able to go. And um, sometimes it could be a design system. Other times it might be like, hey, maybe let's improve your style guide or, or yeah. how uh, devs are working with designers to improve like the UX implementation. Or maybe it's a component library, which is a, you know, a happy little start, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. This is really interesting. And I'm glad that you separated those because um, I think it's something that a lot of people have questions about. I think a lot of times we'll use the terms design system and component library together. Yeah. And they're not necessarily this. They can be the same thing. Right. But they're not necessarily the same thing. I really like the way that you separated those because I think I, I completely agree with you. I think that a component library of just things that are better shared, better extracted, better communicated, um, or like designed components that other people can utilize is often a really great place to start if you don't have the, uh, you know, the team or the structure or the uh, kind of ability to take on like a full on design system. Um, you know, being able to collaborate on just individual components that have uh, an opportunity to live across, you know, applications or uh, across needs like marketing or your uh, kind of application and whatnot um, seems like a really great place to start what you're talking about, which is this collaborative process of hearing from everybody, developing something together that can be shared and um, kind of learning about distribution through like your different products. And usually that itself is like actually deciding to create a component library is the starting point for creating the processes or formalizing some of the processes um, around design rules um, and patterns and usually will produce enough waves on a team. Um, generally, you know, like feeling like that um, bridge or the communication between devs and uh, designers um, sometimes they get kind of irritated when I tell them, well, this already exists in the component library, or I see <laughs> yeah. you created what um, at my work, I guess, could be called um, orphaned or snowflake components, where you take something from an existing library and you like kind of modify it because you're under, you know, time pressure um, to deliver something. And yeah, that, that tends to be something that people eventually get like, or people working in design systems get a little like hung up on because yeah, it, um, you, yeah, you, you kind of like circumvent that whole process of discussion or whatever, and you create the technical and design yeah. decision <laughs> depth um, <laughs> by doing so. And so, yeah, the, introducing the component library and then the, all the uh, questions around like, oh, how are we going to distribute it? You know, is it going to be in a mono repo? Is it going to be a package? <laughs> yeah. Are we using Git sub modules? Like this, this ends up being like quite a discussion. Um, but yeah, I think it comes down to like whether there's backing from like yeah. technical and design leadership. And also, yeah, um, I do find or like in my own very short career, like, you know, creating those proof of concepts and demos on the weekend or on the side, demoing them to a team, I think has only gone so far to introduce and sensitize mm. um, like less mature, like less UX mature, less front end mature companies to it. And so then the next step for me was like looking at jobs where like, okay, yeah, I can really, you know, focus on like um, the, I guess, bringing in not just, you know, like design sprints or looking mm -hmm. at um, how to um, do better design, but like actually have that collaboration between the teams and being able to advise or um, recommend like 
current ways of like implementing the front end. Yeah. Um, yeah, I feel like there's this process of feeling out whether the company is open to those kinds of collaborations or implementations. <laughs> yeah, because there can definitely be a fight. And and I know that I experienced that uh, in, in my own career was there was a there was a desire to get there, but not necessarily like money on the table to do that. Right. Like there wasn't, you know, mm-hmm. budget or allocation or uh, support for the actual effort that got you there um, or got the company there. And I think a lot of times that can be like an area of um that is really hard to communicate because I think a lot of times companies like salivate over the idea of like, oh, someone wrote this and now we can use it everywhere. And like that'll save us so much time and effort and yeah. money. And like that's really generally not the thing that you save is like time. It's more the the kind of collaboration that you gain and the kind of like cross communication of teams. And like it's it, it's more like the health that you gain than like saving a lot of time. I I have not up to this point, seeing design systems or component libraries, like really, you know, save a lot of time and money. (laughs) Yeah, no, uh, I think it's just like, it's to do with how you think about software or like design systems, right? Like, um, I think like, there's also an assessment of like agile (laughs) maturity, perhaps. Um, Sometimes you work with clients that, you know, do salivate over like having this like very, you know, uh, one and done, like yeah. all encompassing, <laughs> like this is going to work everywhere type thing. But yeah. kind of like with any software, because particularly like front ends changing every six months, you need to maintain it. And so, yeah, I mean, sometimes those fights are internal around like whether people will actually give you time to do so, right? And wh- and then whether the rest of your dev team is going to be happy to to learn storybook or learn, um, yeah, how to work with like importing packages from different repos and I don't know, or even learn to package and roll up a component library, those kinds of things, right? Instead of being able to just two lines, <laughs> it's just, you know, <laughs> NPM install material and then import it. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. Over time, I was finding that I would just like get all these very <laughs> strange pedantic, like technical hangups, like, you know, oh, you've imported a material and you're also importing bootstrap components. I understand you have, you know, crunch deadline to meet, but also for a white label product, this is like just really increasing the size of our bundling. Yeah, and, yeah. But again, like everything coming down so much to like what stakeholders internal and external prioritize. I think there's, yeah, careful picking of like what battles and also like constant evaluation of like, okay, does this fit in, you know, my growth goals and, um, you know, can I maybe table this and like focus yeah. on just making this kind of impact at the company? I love that. I I mean, I could talk about this all day, but uh, I I want to respect your time and uh, and our listeners' time. Uh, but I'm curious. We are over time. I know we're like we're well <laughs> over. We could go on this for hours. Um, but I'm curious if you were to design a path for yourself, uh, you know, to get back to where you're at into you know into design systems where you're at today, uh, for people who are just kind of breaking into tech, but but have that interest in you know, in design, in development, in kind of like creating an internal product, developer productivity, all those kinds of things. Um, what are some of those like like big pillar moments that you try to recreate if you had to kind of start over from scratch? It's very strange because in reflection, that uh, whole like, you know, first couple years, the feeling of needing to know and learn everything was a huge thing that perhaps set myself back because the whole like, you know, I'm going to watch however many tutorials to learn any framework, Um, being able to like take it step by step and then understand that as part of like working as a UX developer or um, design technologist or perhaps like even just a UX designer, you know, there are certain tools that are commonly used in the industry and to kind of just stick like almost like six to 12 weeks at a time, you know, like I'm going to learn Figma and, you know, figure out the hotkeys and, you know, give myself a challenge or, but to keep it like a sketch, right? Like, you know, no one's expecting you to recreate, you know, perfectly 
the Facebook icon or whatever, but to like, uh, yeah, take a lot of these things like almost like small exercises. And that really helped me, but it took me such a long time to learn was to chunk down like those things that I thought I should be able to know. And then at some point, um, yeah, that comfort increased with learning things. So yeah, like where is it, if you start out thinking like, oh yeah, I got to build like a NFT marketplace <laughs> with, um, you know, drag and drop, <laughs> drag and drop images and that will mint itself. Like that, that's a very ambitious kind of uh project. Yeah. And to think of everything like, you know, a prototype at first, but then to even chunk it down, like something I started doing like in the last two years was to kind of create code sandboxes or like throw away repos that would just exemplify like how I could imagine doing something. Like one aspect, like I don't know, like loading like custom fonts or like um how to, you know, write very clean kind of examples for switching tabs in a component. Um, and so like, yeah, to chunk down that and to do it step by step. O over time though, like I noticed that, yeah, your interests are gonna drive you. And so there's that design implementation aspect. You might like, you know, try creating a couple style guides. When you join a startup that might not have as much, I guess, bandwidth to be paying a designer yet yeah, sometimes they might get like a uh, contracted designer mm. or they'll like have someone who's straddling that design and dev role and that was very it like yeah really pushed me to do both but at some point i realized that like okay yeah you kind of do have to take time to focus on this part or that part and so it it may feel like you're slowing down but i i would say that like every kind of like I guess any amount of time you spend on learning and experiencing that role is going to be like an accretion towards your design system goal, right? So yeah, if you decide to spend six to 12 weeks or whatever on learning Figma or creating, I don't know, like cross-browser responsive exports of mockups, like that's cool. And then like maybe like switch over to like, okay, now maybe like learning how to, you know, create a uh, static site generated um, and deployed type blog in React. It doesn't have to be fancy or whatever. But yeah, being able to find areas from those two kind of fields like design UX and then front end, mm -hmm. and then to find those areas at work where you're able to, yeah, kind of, yeah, do high leverage type things. I don't mean leverage as in like political power, like, hey, CEO, please let me, you know, create a component library, but more like, I like, for example, realizing that your fellow devs might not be uh, documenting the startup instructions for your project and kind of trying to, you know, hey, what do you guys think? Like, let's do that in the readme. So whoever's new that joins going to like know to also use that as a kind of like documentation source and to improve everyone's experience of using the software um that's a really small example but it's kind of easy because then it's maybe like updating the doc it's five lines yeah um hopefully they're not going to argue about like white space shifts <laughs> or <laughs> whether you capitalize the i in internet but um yeah it it's going to accrue i think and yeah then from that, I feel like always from trying a particular role, you can reflect on whether or not you're fitted for it. So in the case of me wishing that I could be an A-list artist and professor in my early 20s, and then realizing, oh yeah, like cram learning, you know, code libraries, teaching processing, whatever, like it's, I mean, that's fun. And also allowing like students to see like that kind of like aha moment of like, who yeah, I can like, you know, create visualizations in code. That's super fun. But then I realized I just like the whole area of like the I think when I got over that whole like hump of like, oh God, like this is so hard. There's so much to learn. I'm never gonna like know it to being more like, 
um, okay, I can take this step by step and yeah, to learn and like try, um, yeah, incrementally has, has been a, a much better, I guess, like healthier place for me to get to. <laughs> and then eventually just like, yeah, for me, that art and design and like dev not being in separate worlds. But for me, maybe I made sense of it because I just wanted to be able to implement all my ideas. Um, the ideal being like, yeah, if I could like write this silly app, you know, timing how long people took to pee, <laughs> have little like funny like visualizations or whatever, you know. It, I mean, it it's kind of like you know trivial, but you know, what if I could do that like effortlessly on the weekend? Um, it's an ideal, but yeah, I, I think I, I made meaning out of you know like um, enjoying like the kind of uh, implementation of design and then also like creating kind of like a, a wonderful or like amusing experience. I love that so much. And I think I think this is an area where I'm so grateful that you were able to join us because your like your art uh, work has really gives you such a unique perspective on this. Like even even just the idea of like keeping, uh, like having a sketch, having more sketch ideas where you you explore a single concept and try to make it as small as possible. But that in itself does not have to be a productive piece of work as long as it is kind of moving you forward as um, as an artist, as a developer, towards the things that you want to be creating. Um, I just, I love that idea. And I think a lot of times, you know, coming from a more like engineering side, maybe you think about like this thing needing to be able, like production ready, I guess, right? And there's a whole set of criteria that it needs to to fit. And we forget a lot of times that there's such a huge value for us in that play side of things where we're just exploring and we're sketching and just trying something out that doesn't have to have like value. I'm putting my like finger quotes up right now, but um I think it does have value, actually. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It's things that people, I, I really delight people, I think, on Toronto JS and something that we love, like, sharing with others as well is that kind of uh, the process code sandbox. Yeah. Or the, you know, dummy domain. Like, hey, look what I did, you know, taking, like, weather API info and trying to turn it into a widget. Um yeah, there, there's something like just very fun and low stakes about that. And sometimes we don't know who we help by yeah. making that actually. Yeah. yeah, I love that. Well, uh, Jen, how can people get uh, connected with you uh, online or uh, Toronto JS in the future? So yeah, uh, torontojs.com. There's the join Slack button in the top of the menu. Uh, I'm in there. My handle is Jen C. And also, yeah, I'm on the Discord, um, on Storybook, um, kind of pop in and out different communities. Yeah. I am never afraid to ask questions. And uh, yeah, on Twitter, it's at Geninator and Jennifer-Chan.com for artwork. Yeah. Awesome. And then JenChan.biz um, is my very not up-to-date. Um, I don't know, work front website. Yeah. <laughs> nice, nice. Uh, well, Jen, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, chat with us today. I, I, I love the way that you think about design systems, component libraries, like the way that you're integrating all of your your interests. And um, I, I, I learned a ton today and I am just really grateful for your time. Uh, friends, thank you so much for uh, listening and watching this episode. I hope that you enjoyed it and learned something as well. Uh, if you liked it, uh, hit the like button and uh, subscribe for future interviews like this, where you can learn about design systems, design implementation, development, art, like all, all, all the kind of cool stuff that brings us uh, brings us together in this, uh, this fun space. So uh, thank you for being here. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next time. Peace. <laughs>